Namaste, good evening. How I became a Hindu, or in my case, a Krishna Bhakta, is something that many people ask, especially when I go to India. It's one of the common questions I get. Or what attracted me so much to India and its culture? Many people wonder why, if I'm born in the opulence and decadence of the West, would I be so interested in India? So how I became a Krishna Bhakta goes back to when I was a teenager, when I became a musician. I spent time hanging out with other musicians, artists, and hippies of the area, and though we would express ourselves in various ways, we would still get serious at times and sit down and wonder what was our real purpose in this life and where we really fit into this world. Then, in my later teenage years, I had to sit my guitar down for a while and do some considerable research into the various philosophies and spiritual paths of the worlds to find some solid answers to, for the real purpose of life, which to me was my most perplexing question. Having grown up as a Christian, of course, which was typical of most people in America, I decided to seriously look into it. I studied the Bible, not only in Sunday school and church, but privately I read the Bible from cover to cover. It took me a year to do that, so I, fairly, I was fairly determined, but I did it. This was simply to see what was really contained in its pages. I was just very curious, but I had more questions that it could answer. So I had to keep searching for the spiritual knowledge I wanted to know, because if you look deeply into the Bible, it mostly covers moralistic principles and histories and stories, of course, of what to do and what not to do. So these, of course, are necessary for any religious path, but it is only the beginning. I wanted to know more about spiritual knowledge and the process to increase my spiritual perception. The fact of the matter is that most religions start with faith and end with faith and don't necessarily encourage one's own spiritual realizations. And thus it leaves little spiritual experiences or realizations in between. So obviously I had to look elsewhere for the information I needed. Now is that being difficult? Uh, I don't think so, not according to my logic anyway, because I was just asking the kind of questions that any inquisitive or decent human being would ask. But if you look, what does the Bible say about God, or even in simple matters such as what is his form, what does he look like, other than mentioning that he appeared as a burning bush or a dove, etc., it does not say much. It also says he is a jealous and angry God, but why would God be angry and jealous, and of who? Uh, he already owns everything and everyone is under his control, so what is the problem? Or is it actually a matter of humanity merely projecting their own weaknesses on their conception of God or placing their own demands in to the instructions of God or what they expect of others? In such a case, the conception of God that is presented is not really God at all, but merely mankind's idea of what God is based on uh, according to their own weaknesses or imagination. Well, this was not what I wanted to learn. Furthermore, what does the Bible really say about the soul, about our spiritual nature, about our spiritual relationship with God and each other, or even about heaven and hell, or things like that? Furthermore, it was completely absent of any description of the soul, as it really does not say all that much regarding higher spiritual knowledge, which means there are numerous questions left unanswered. So, where do we go uh, to find the answers? Well, I had to look everywhere, so therefore I studied, you know, Judaism, Egyptology, even magic, witchcraft, I Ching, palmistry, tarot, voodoo, Zen Buddhism, uh, even mysticism, yoga, of course, and many other esoteric topics. I even read most of the Koran. However, the problems I had with the Bible were the same as with the Koran. In this way, it became obvious to me that all religions are not the same. They definitely take you to different levels of understanding. Thus I had to continue looking for the answers I needed for a higher understanding and for things to make sense to me. Uh, but fear-based religions, or those that promise hell and punishment if not followed, were not for me. I did not want the fear of going to hell as the main motivation for accepting a particular religion, or a dogma that everyone was supposed to accept in order to go to heaven, or to maintain an approved connection with an institution or church simply to keep from being excommunicated and thus, of course, going to eternal damnation, or so the story usually goes. I wanted a path that could give me a natural and progressive way to attain a clear perception of the spiritual dimension and not a dogma or a fear-based indoctrination or blind faith. Thus, in all my research, I finally read the Bhagavad Gita, which was like the final piece of the puzzle that I had been putting together from all of my philosophical and spiritual investigation. I could see that all of the spiritual paths were connected. They all evolved around the central point of getting closer and understanding God. 
but through the knowledge they offer, they can bring a person to different levels of consciousness, some higher, some lower. But the Bhagavad Gita gave me exactly what I needed, which was a big boost in spiritual understanding, and I knew I needed more of this kind of information. So I went on to read the Upanishads, Vedanta Sutras, Yoga Sutras, and other texts, including the Puranas. These all gave me profound insights into the purpose of life, and that I was a spiritual being and only a passing tourist on this planet as I moved forward, preparing for higher realms. So, as I studied the Eastern texts, it became clear that we all have a connection with God, regardless of what our religion is, or whether we have a connection with a religious institution or church or not. All we have to do is reawaken that relationship. And the Vedic system gives you many tools to choose from to help you do that, such as gurus and teachers, sacred texts, temples for worship and learning, systems of yoga, and processes of development. Nothing is forced on you. In the Vedic process, you can choose your own speed at which you advance, your own methods that work best for you, the level of understanding, and the spiritual texts you want to use. You decide whatever lessons you need to learn in order to proceed in this life. And whatever advancement you make is never lost. It is always connected with the soul. It keeps you going from one level to the next. It is a matter of proceeding at the rate that works best for you so that your spiritual progress unfolds naturally, not artificially, not superficially, and certainly not something that's forced on you. The Vedic system expects you to have your own spiritual awakenings and experiences when you are ready for them or developed enough. There is no time limit. It's not this life or nothing at all, but so many lives can be incorporated in your progress. The point is that the more spiritual you become, the more you can perceive that which is spiritual. That is the key. In such a way, the spiritual dimension no longer remains a mystery or merely something you study and learn about, or something that's shoved down your throat, or a dogma that must be followed and believed in, but it becomes a reality, something to experience and directly perceive. And that makes all the difference. Thus, I imbibed the teachings within the Vedic texts and that of Lord Krishna and took up the path of yoga, especially bhakti yoga, or devotional service, and became a Krishna bhakta. Thereafter, I lived in an ashram to practice, study, and be trained in the uh, Vedic teachings and learn the way of regulated spiritual life, or sadhana, along with temple rituals, or puja, and so forth until I became initiated into the Brahma Gaudiya Sampradaya, under the auspices of Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and when that was then given the name of Sri Nandanandana Das. Several months later, I was also Brahminically initiated as well. One of the reasons why I became a Krishna Bhakta is that he is the god of unconditional love, which is something that everyone is looking for. And he also instructed in the Bhagavad Gita to stand up and protect Sanatana Dharma for the benefit of others. At the Battle of Kuruksetra, Arjuna wanted to leave the battlefield and go to the forest and meditate. Not a bad idea, but Lord Krishna said no. It was best to do one's duty and stand up to protect Dharma, not only for oneself, but for all others as well. By working for the benefit of others in such a way, one simultaneously helps oneself, and you get a little of the credit or punya for whatever advancement others make because of your endeavors. And now this is one of my main activities, not only pursuing my own practice with Sanatana Dharma, but helping to preserve, protect, and promote or explain Vedic culture so others can understand, utilize, and benefit from it. And this is why I engage in making these kind of talks and writing so many books and have such a big website, to help others understand this knowledge. I have studied all the world religions and no other text or scripture offers such a depth of spiritual information. That is why I have concluded that the Vedic philosophy is the last bastion of deep spiritual truth and knowledge. Nothing offers what it does. Vedic culture essentially takes up where the Western religions leave off. Anybody can take it up, and anybody can learn more of, from whatever level of spiritual knowledge they're coming from. Though I may respect all paths, and still study portions of them for comparative reasons, what is the point of going back to something less profound, less expansive, less spiritual, or even less dynamic than what we have in the Dharmic tradition and philosophy is found in India? In this way, Vedic culture, Sanatana Dharma, gave me the insights I needed to understand the purpose of life, what I was doing here, where I came from, and where I'm going based on my actions in this life, and how to acquire the highest levels of spiritual perception. 
It gave me the means to keep going in this world, and for me, without those things, my life remained incomplete and void of real meaning. Why bother with something that made little sense to me? And materialistic life was just that, something that made no sense to me. So I will continue to follow Sanatana Dharma, as well as work to preserve, protect, and promote it for the benefit of others until the day I die. Obviously, what else is there? And I invite all others to join me on this great path. Kindly use this information, and I'm sure you'll get as much, as much enlightenment out of it as I have. And for that reason, once again, I write the books and maintain my website and make these presentations for the benefit of others. Thank you very much, and good luck. Jai Shri Krishna. Namaste.